Okay, now let's cover some of the aspects right here. Let's start off with chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is Jesus Christ's revelation, so we know that. And notice who he gives it to. Which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So God gives uh, Jesus the revelation to show to us, his servants, things that must shortly come to pass. So notice that these things must shortly come to pass. Now, you'll notice that we believe in this doctrine concerning the imminence, the imminent return of Christ. We believe in that doctrine, the imminence. Sometimes post-tribulation do not believe in that. You'll look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20. Notice that the verse, it shows that Jesus Christ is coming very soon. He's coming very quickly. Look at Revelation chapter 22, and then we'll read verse 20. Notice right here that we believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That is a doctrine. Post-tribulation people, they do not believe in this, in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. So in other words, the imminent return of Jesus Christ is that the rapture can happen any moment. So we believe it can happen right now. So the imminent return of Christ. But no, post-tribulation believes, no, we need the Antichrist first. We need the tribulation first. Then Jesus Christ, he comes in sometime later or after. No, we don't believe in that. We believe that he can, uh, the rapture can happen any moment. So that's why we're pre-trib. That's why pre-tribulation is pre-tribulation rapture is always tied to this imminent return. You'll notice that. So remember, pre-tribulation rapture means rapture before the tribulation. That's what we believe in. The imminent return of Jesus Christ is proven at chapter 1, verse 1, as well as chapter 22, verse 20. The Bible says right here, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, amen. Even so, what? Present tense, come Lord Jesus. Why would we put that at the present tense? Because we believe that if we pray, Lord, will you rapture us right now? Will you rapture us soon? We believe that it can apply. It can happen any moment, see? We're not going to say, Lord, please get the Antichrist over here quickly and help us to go through the seven-year tribulation quickly and then come. See, we don't do that. We believe that he can come in any moment, any time. So we believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Now, the criticism toward this is that if Jesus Christ is coming really soon, it's been 2,000 years. <laughs> and I have to agree with that. You know, I think, I think it, this, Lord, how much longer? I think 2,000 years is not too soon. Well, look at the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Look at the last chapter of 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3. Here's a simple answer. Didn't you know that God lived for eternity? Yeah, come on. See? So 6,000 years is like a blip. It's like a wink of an eye to him. Why doesn't God answer my prayer request? Because your God is not in a hurry. He lived for all eternity. Mm. How about that? Human beings, we want it quick. That's why you have to have an iPhone, because you need it quick. You want it instantly. You want it on the spot. That's a fleshy thing. And you need to get into the spirit and look at God's timetable, how he does things. Okay, look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Notice in verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years as what? One day. See, to God, it's just a day to him. You know what's very interesting? I'm not going to get into this, but look up where the Bible talks about two days. Two days. Two days. It's been 2,000 years. That means we're really, yeah, we're really there. The calendars, calendars are slightly off. We're just almost there. See that? Even so, come Lord Jesus. All right. So that's why Jesus Christ in God's clock in his timetable, it's very soon. All right, let's return. Revelation. 
chapter 1. All right, let's continue reading verse 1. Now, remember, as I go through verse-by-verse -verse Bible studies, pay attention to when I'm reading and explaining it. Because uh, a lot of people, especially first-timers who, who have trouble understanding the Bible, if you attend this verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, it's going to give you a common sense gist later on. A lot of people complain, and a lot of them are troubled, honestly troubled, and tell me, the Bible's too hard to understand, Pastor. But the thing is this, is that if you go through this verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, you're going to get the gist, and then trust me, within six months or a year, <clears throat> you're going to get it. You're going to get it, and you'll be able to read by yourself. This happened to several of my members before, so this happened. Okay, so pay attention. Here we go. This last part of verse 1. And he sent and signified it by his angel. So the Lord Jesus Christ sent this revelation and had his angel signify it unto who? Unto his servant John. So John is the writer, and John is the person. Ah, so here's something interesting to understand about God's revelation, which is why it is very important if you don't have these steps, then you're not getting right revelation from the Lord. Okay, so remember this. The Father starts it off, right, with his revelation. He gives it to the Son. Now pay attention at chapter 1, verse 1. Do you see that? See, God the Father gives it to the Son. The Son sends it by an angel. Then he gives it, what? He gives it to his servant, John. So then there's a preacher right here. And then to what? His servants. That's how it works. You'll notice that. That's how you get revelation from the Father. But you're not going to get it if you don't get the right God. The right Jesus. The right angel. Because Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Joseph Smith professed he had his angel. Muhammad professed he had his angel. You don't get it unless you get the right preacher. That's why I always resort to an independent, fundamental, Baptist, King James only, dispensational, Bible-believing pastor. Anything outside of that? Sorry, I only take it with a grain of salt. Amen. And then, how do you know you're fellowshipping with the right people? See? You attend an independent, fundamental, Baptist, King James only, dispensational church. If it's... So, this is how you get revelation from the Father. Now, this is dangerous. If someone is giving you end times... Revelation stuff, and this is how you start, and then you go here, you're in trouble. You see that? You see that? That is a problem there. Let me give you another example. Where's the arrow, Pastor? No, I'm serious. This is how people are in churches nowadays. They think they get revelation from the Father just like that. So you got to realize this is that if God thought it, it was going to be that way, we should not even have a church. We should not even have teachers or preachers of the word of God. Look at that. So you got to realize this. This is the process. And how you get this right process is you find the right God, the right Jesus, the right angel, the right preacher, and you're around the right servant. That's how it should be done. That's how God, if you look at, if you doubt this, you are doubting 2,000 years of how God used his church. You got 2,000 years of history from God. So you got to realize this. You got, that's why I stress so much of being part and attending and being active in a local Bible-believing church. You got to realize that started ever since the timeline of Jesus. Jesus started out with church. That's how the Holy Spirit first came down. It's so with the church. When the Christians were persecuted, they had underground churches. When the Catholic church sprouted out, the Waldensians came out. They had their preacher boys coming out. You had uh, Luther, you had uh, John Wesley with the Methodists, and then you had the Great Awakening revivals. How did the Holy Spirit power come down and change a whole country and the world? It was always through this sort of system. See that? You are doubting 2,000 years. So that's why it is important that you've got to get outside of this and get over here. 
Otherwise, then your spiritual life is going to be very unbalanced, unhealthy. And not only that, you're going to burden yourself and other people around you. And I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Okay, let's go to verse 2. So John, his servant, what? Bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John, he, bear, he bore record of God's word right there. So what is important to understand is that what signifies a right preacher is that he bears record of the word of God. It's the Bible. So the Bible is our final authority. Now here's another thing right here. How God also reveals his revelation, the second part of verse 2, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the word of God prophesies the future. The testimony of Jesus Christ also prophesies about the future. This relates to our previous point right here about the right preacher as well. Look at his testimony. So is his testimony right with the Lord? So I can't trust preachers out there. Well, how can you not trust them unless you look at their testimony? See? Yeah. So until you look at this preacher's testimony right here, then I can finally earn and gain and win your trust, right? So you got to look at the testimony. See the testimony if the preacher is on the right track. You know what people do? Because they look at the person's testimony, they don't look at how it contradicts the word of God. And they only look at the word of God, but they don't look at the person's testimony. Now you got to realize this. You got to look at both together. You got to look at both together. And looking at both together, then you can see right here, okay then. So I know that this is God's man who he's using right here. But this prophesies the future, right? So here's something interesting for you. The testimony of Jesus Christ, we all have that within us. Don't we all bear, uh, don't we all bear witness of our testimony in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. So it's not just preachers who have a good testimony. You got, you got to think like this, okay? You can't just say, oh, pastors got to watch out for their testimony. No, you got to watch out for your testimony too. You got to realize that uh, you got to realize that your coworker is not going to meet your pastor and the only testimony and the only Jesus he or she will ever see is you. So that's why you got to have a good testimony of Jesus Christ. So testimony of Jesus Christ it does predict the future. Really pastor? Yeah, absolutely. How do you know that? How do you know that? Well, if you have if you bear record of Jesus Christ in you, you're bringing forth the testimony to them that you are saved. You know where you're going yeah. 50 years later if you were to die. You're, you already made that future clear. You made the future clear to them that you know what God's going to do with your problem. All things work together for good in the future. You trust in him. You bear record that I'm looking for the rapture of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not the Antichrist, but the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to get me out before the tribulation starts. You're predicting that future. You're showing him that testimony of that future that your sin will put you in hell if you don't get saved in Jesus Christ. Say that to a person when you witness to them. Aren't you prophesying? Yes, you are showing them the future right there. Another thing, verse, the last part of verse 2, which is a no-brainer, and of all things that he saw. So John bears record of not just the Word of God testimony, but everything he saw. So John, what he saw at Revelation, eh, my bad, okay. What John saw at Revelation is obviously prophecy. Now, this is something you want to make a note for dispensationalism. People apply the passages in the book of Revelation doctrinally to themselves. But that's wrong. You, Revelation, look at, the title, uh, look at the title of the book. It's the Revelation, right? Look at verse 1, which must shortly come to pass. See? That's future, right? So Revelation is a book for the tribulation timeline. It is a tribulation timeline. It is not the church age, today's day and age. So the verse 1 and the book itself already showed you 
what the book of Revelation is applied to. Okay, let's keep reading here. <clears throat> Verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth. So you're blessed if you read this. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. You're blessed if you hear the words of this prophetic book, Revelation. And keep those things which are written therein. If you keep what is written at Revelation, you're blessed. For the time is at hand. See that? The time is at hand. In other words, the end is coming. It's right over here at the door. That supports the imminent return of Jesus Christ. See that? It's like any moment. It's right at hand. And in God's timetable, it's like at hand. So you are blessed if you do so. Now what's important is this, is that that's why Revelation, if you, what scholars want to chop off verses in the book of Revelation, spiritualize verses so that you don't keep and read these words. That you don't take these words literally as they say. See, they're robbing you of a blessing. So this kind of approach that is preterist, or that is post or amillennial, they are robbing you a blessing. Premillennial literally goes by the word as it says, so that you can keep and read the words as verse 3 mentioned. 